But let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Divine One, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Uh, today's scripture lesson that's kind of guided this whole thing comes from the very beginning of Genesis. You all know that story and I won't remind you of it, but the part I do want you to remember is Genesis 1.31. God saw all that she had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a new day. I've been thinking a lot in the last few weeks about our friend Alexis Beerman. I am learning that Circle might actually be an oval or something without her. You know, a little saggy. For all the times she keeps me in track or in line, I can only imagine the heavy lifting she does for y'all on the regular, so let's just thank her, shall we? And thank you for your permission this morning for me, for us, to feel our feelings. Um, I think I've already cried like a dozen times today. That's also a warning for you. Um, but it's a gift to have a space where all of me is honored and welcome. And so thank you for naming that. Alexis asked me for a title for this talk several weeks ago so she could tell y'all what I'd be talking about today. And my brain does the thing where I have an idea, but then at 3 a.m. the day of, I have six other ideas. And so I wrestle with the divine until she wins and I write. So I just never know where it's going to go. So I just don't title sermons. Right? Like, that's never been a thing. So Alexis, God bless her, said, maybe just choose a generic title. And we can advertise that, but it has enough wiggle room for you and God to move around in. And I said, you know what, Alexis, that is so smart. How about love beyond measure? And she said, perfect. Because, you see, that's a thing I say to my people almost every time when I preach. I tell them hard things. And then I remind them of the gospel message, which is you are free, you are forgiven, you are loved beyond measure by the divine one. Great, perfect, we thought. And then last night, as I was closing my eyes, much later than I should have been, my sweet little dog, Fig, curled up right next to me. My brain whispered, okay, smarty pants, but what is love? And then I just couldn't sleep. Couldn't find my iPad either, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Love is this word that we toss around an awful lot, and it means a whole lot of things, and none of us can adequately describe it. The word shows up in the Tanakh approximately 317 times. It appears in the Bible 538 times, depending on your translation. Its root appears in the Quran about 95 times. But it turns out that it's easier to talk about what love isn't and to talk about what love is. Love is not possession or obsession or self-center or control. I've been working through some things in my college days lately. So I decided to start where 20-year-old Annie would have started with the dictionary. Honestly, at first I found Webster's definition to be lacking. Webster said that love is strong affection warm attachment, a term of endearment, the act of copulation, see also to make love. It's a score of zero as in tennis. But then, right? But then, Webster boldly writes in all caps, love is G-O-D, God. And finally, Love is unselfish, loyal, benevolent, concern for the good of another. There it is. Several years ago, we started talking collectively about love languages, how we receive or hear love best. Y'all familiar? Do you know what yours are? I'm just curious. Um, the five traditional love languages, I guess it's traditional by now, are uh, words of affirmation, uh, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, 
physical touch. Recently, to my sheer delight, we have identified love languages of neurodivergent folks. Info dumping, parallel play, support swapping, please crush my soul back into my body, and penguin peddling. We neurodivergent folks are a lot of fun. I'm autistic. My primary love languages are please crush my soul back into my body, with consent, of course, and info dumping, or reciting vast qual quantities of knowledge to a receptive audience. So see, I do love you. <laughs> and there you are, sitting there listening so kindly. Thank you for loving me. This week I've been asking people uh, who are important to me what their love languages are. Largely because of this morning's talk, but also to see if I've been guessing correctly or if maybe they've changed since we last talked because their behaviors have changed. Putting that information into my intellectual vault, I suppose. I don't want to get too much further off of my own path, but I do recommend that you ask folks how they receive love because often how we show it and how we receive it are two very different things. For example, I am excellent at penguin peppling. I love to do that. Not much more brings me joy than giving away a token, a little piece of ceramic that I've made, or a lollipop, or a copy of my favorite book, or just a link to a song that reminds me of something you said. But for heaven's sake, if you give me something, I will be awkward and shy and delighted, but it is a whole thing. I say this to echo what many, many writers and poets have said before me. Love is paying attention. Dr. Leo Mascalia was an Italian-American author and was also known as Dr. Love from his tenure at the University of Southern California. A lot of y'all are nodding. In 1972, he wrote a book with a simple title, Love. It is available wherever books are sold and on Audible. In 1996, I took an art appreciation class from Pat Odom at the Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. Love was one of two primary texts for that course. Ms. Odom believed that you cannot love and appreciate art until you understand love and appreciate yourself. I thought we were gonna be talking about Rembrandt. Turned out we talked a lot about me. But it was a class that changed my life because it was a class that helped me to begin to move toward healing. I say begin to move because life is really long and I don't think we ever actually do it. We just keep practicing it every day. But it was a class that helped me begin to slowly, very, very slowly deconstruct the negative emotional framework that had been building in me since infancy. I'm going to go out on a limb here and just take a wild guess that the vast majority of us in this room have had what I like to call complicated childhoods. <laughs> yeah. Me too. What we know is that we receive messages as children from the world around us. Maybe we remember what those messages looked like at the time and maybe we don't. But we understand our value and our place in the world because of those messages received. And here's the thing, it absolutely doesn't matter if that was the intended message sent. For example, my earliest memory, I was six months old. I thought I was nine months old, but when I called and asked my dad if this was actually a thing that happened, he was shocked that I remembered and corrected my age, I was six months old. And yeah, it is a blessing and an absolute curse to remember things the way that I do. It was a cold night, November. My parents fed me beef stew, not the beef, just the vegetables that had been slow cooked, and I remember them glistening in the light when they sat on the tray of my high chair. I remember that warm feeling and the delight and the texture of the carrots as I squished and ate them as they rolled over my tongue. I remember feeling sleepy and my dad scooping me up and carrying me through the house to my bedroom. I remember the look over his shoulder of the smooth wood floors. I remember the cool crib sheet and the slow descent into slumber. And then I remember the waking. 
I woke up suddenly with my stomach churning and the taste of bile rising and the pain of my little stomach violently emptying itself. And my father came and scooped me up and told me it was okay. And he held me and he bathed me and he put me in fresh pajamas and back into bed and I fell back into slumber. And then I woke up and it happened all over again and again and again until we were out of clean crib sheets. I remember my parents arguing. We were out of crib sheets, but my mother didn't want my dad to put the extra set on my bed. I remember she was really angry with him. And I remember my father nestling me down into his bed beside my angry mother. And I remember her saying, Julian, I don't want her. I remember the fear and the hurt and the free fall into the emotional abyss. And my father left the room with a woman, my mother, who was furious and didn't want me. Now he had just gone down the hall to get an extra set of sheets and put them on my bed anyway. He returned, scooped me up, carried me back to my crib and stood there while I fell back to sleep. And the next morning when I opened my eyes, I could see my father sleeping on the rug by my crib, his white t-shirt aglow in the sliver of light that crept through the crack between that pull-down shade from the 1970s and the windowsill. Now the message I received that night was twofold. One, my mother did not want me and was someone to be afraid of. And two, that my father would at all costs love and protect me. But then, when I was four, my parents divorced and my dad moved away, and the message I received was that I was on my own. Was I actually on my own? No. My dad, my stepmother, and my grandparents, and my aunts fiercely loved me and kept watch even though I didn't see them every day. Was it true that my mother didn't want me? Absolutely not. She loved me to the best of her ability, and just this week she told me she loves me more than I will ever know. And since I, too, am a mother now, I believe her in a different way. But here's the rub, right? We receive messages in childhood, and whether those were the messages sent, it doesn't matter. Those received messages construct our reality, and our understanding of place and how we perceive our being loved becomes then our idea of home. As an adult, I have sought out and easily found partners who felt like home to me. Partners from whom I received the same familiar messages from my childhood, that I'm unwanted unless I can make myself small and quiet and convenient or helpful, and that if I need something, I'm on my own. And again, it doesn't really matter what messages they're laying down, right? It matters what I pick up, what message is familiar and easy to decode. And I'm learning that my partners have chosen me for the very same reason. They read into messages that I send whatever comes through their childhood framework. So I say I love you in info dump, for example, and they might receive it as you don't know anything. So then we have a whole other problem. And that's where relationships break down. Now again, disclaimer. Abusive relationships and mental health issues are a whole different story, and when you're in a relationship with someone who has, say, a personality disorder, you can toss a lot of this out the window. And you are welcome to come talk to me after Circle. I can help you find some resources. But love is paying attention. And love is using the information you receive from paying attention to make better the life of the person you love. Leo Vascalia says that love is always bestowed as a gift, freely, willingly, and without expectation. We don't love to be loved. We love to love. Here's what I know for sure. Love is somehow, inexplicably, simultaneously the most simple, and the most complicated thing in our whole human experience. There are just too many variables to tuck it in a box and say, here you go, it's good. And this has been a difficult talk for me because in my search for simplicity of title, I bit off way more than I could chew in our time together. 
lucky for me, and maybe lucky for you, that is active, I might come back and I agreed, so we'll likely work on this some more. And maybe this is the only thing I'll ever really work on again, because maybe Webster is right. Maybe love is G-O-D. So, my people, beloved, hear this good news. Whether you receive it through a loving, perfect childhood framework, or whether yours is just real, real complicated, you are forgiven for all of the things that you have done that are real or that are imagined. You are freed from the idea that you are bad to live a life where you make the world better for someone else, for someone else, for someone else, out of benevolence. And you are loved, extended that good stuff beyond measure by the Divine One, the one who created you and called you very good, the one who continues to send those messages to you. I promise you, she is paying attention. And if you're struggling to hear that from the people in your life, consider that perhaps you just don't speak the same language. Maybe listen again. And if you still can't hear it, here's my invitation to you. Look around. Seriously, go ahead. Look at each other. There's a lot of people in this room. If you still can't hear it, anyone here, you saw it, I can tell, anyone here will gladly remind you, you are worthy of love, of being loved, because love lives inside you. G-O-D, the Divine One, lives in you. Amen. Amen. I invite Michelle up to lead our meditation. Thank you so very much, Emma. Appreciate it. Let's take a few moments to really feel the power of giving and receiving love. And if you're able, Place both feet flat on the floor. Place your arms on your lap, palms up, palms down, whatever's relaxing for you. You'd like close your eyes. And then I want you to move to the top of your head and feel a glow. It's a glow of love the cool glow of love flowing down your head, your forehead, your brows, your cheek, mouth, jaw, relax.
Love is infinite. Love is limitless. Love is timeless. I invite you to center your awareness, your breath, and in particular to your heart beating. Notice that as you rest your attention in your heart, you're also focused on the whole of who you are. Feel the magnificence of who you truly are. Expand and expand and expand further with each breath. Take in more and more of the love that surrounds you. There is nothing you need to do to earn this, to make this happen, to create this healing force of love. Simply feel your willingness to participate in the ceaseless, miraculous flow of love, moving in and through every cell and being of your body. Do you find your mind drifting off to old memories, problems, hopes? challenges. Do not resist. Simply notice. Simply stay present to your willingness to accept and participate in the ceaseless, miraculous flow of love moving in you, through you, and from you. Do not judge yourself or any part of this process. Simply make yourself available to the healing power of love. And from a place of deep peace, will you accept and embrace fully this love as being your love, your power, your generosity, your compassion to share, and send it out into the world freely, knowing that even as it goes from you, it is flowing back to you. Experience our oneness with all love, rest in love, feel gratitude, share our compassion, give and receive love again. And with, with your next breath, find yourself present in this room.